Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Zoom O'Clock with Tessie Anthony de Nassau. Today, my guest is a very inspirational woman that I met recently, but her story has just caught me, and I just keep thinking about how incredible she is. I really wanted you guys to meet her, and I'm so happy that last minute she could make time for us because she has, if you think I'm busy, her schedule is crazy. So please meet Florence. Florence is a known figure in UK politics, has worked a lot for sustainability and development, is a real champion, champion to raise voices for the unheard, and um, specifically for black minorities, and has just an incredible story herself where she's from, the obstacles she overcame, and where she is right now. So Florence, welcome to Zoom O'Clock. Thank you, Tessie. Good morning. Good morning, my darling. So, would you please tell us a bit about you? What makes Florence Florence? Well, it's been quite a journey, I think. Um, and I think if you wrote the story or made a movie about it, people wouldn't even believe it. It could really only be true. So my background is of uh, biracial and um, I am part West African from Guinea, Liberia. And on the other half, I am Russian Ukrainian. So our roots go deep into different communities around the world. Um, subsequently, I, I have um, been educated and have spent most of my career in Europe, uh, in the United Kingdom. But um, the thing that makes, I guess, defines me is definitely my story. And I cling on to that so significantly, not because I want to reference the past continuously, but I think the power for each individual sits within the story as to why they do what they do, what motivates them, and what gives them their strength ultimately. And that story began in um, a very unusual place in West Africa in Liberia, which was actually a, a very unusual state that was established, and it was a back to Africa slave movement, mm -hmm. where um, African American uh, freed slaves returned to Africa to uh, create uh, an independent state. So it has quite a unique history. And um, it was a very successful nation. Um, and it was one of the first independent republics. And we've had one of the first prime ministers, female prime ministers uh, on the African continent. So it's actually quite a beautiful nation. But uh, due to you know, political unrest and unsustainable uh, policy and economics, um, sadly, the country deteriorated to becoming the second poorest African country at a given point. And we found ourselves fleeing Liberia and leaving because there was an escalation of a civil war um, in, in Liberia. And at that point, I was separated from my uh, parents. Uh, my mother made the decision to uh, take me out of West Africa at that given moment. And she, we traveled to um, return to the Ukraine and um, to uh, what was actually at that time, the former Soviet Union, the former USSR. So now we view that region as sort of separate places like Russia and Ukraine, et cetera. But then it was amalgamated into you know, one place that was really russified and everyone was um, made to sort of you know, submit to one, one socialist structure and culture. And my mother made the decision uh, to take me from um, West Africa and uh, to bring me to Ukraine, to Kiev, to live with my grandmother so that I would be safe. And literally it was a case of her traveling in the middle of uh, December, delivering me at the airport, leaving me there and having to return, you know, uh, that very same day. And I remember that conversation because uh, I was you know, a child born in Africa, sunshine, etc. And I remember her that moment at the airport. I was only three years old and she, I said, mommy, I want to go home. And she walked me around the suitcase and said, we are home, sweetheart, we are home. And I remember knowing that that wasn't the truth. But yet, you know, these are, these are the stories that, and moments that you remember and those kind of difficult conversations and the, the sort of traumas that we all carry within us. And so at the age of three, I found myself separated from both my parents and living with my grandparents in the former Soviet Union in, in Kiev. And, uh, but it was a beautiful 
childhood. So I can't say that I lacked in anything bar missing, obviously, my, my parents, which I think is quite traumatic for children at, at a young age to be separated in that given way. But looking back at that decision that my mother made at that given moment, now that I am a mother of two and I have a four and a seven-year-old, at that given moment, my mother made the decision to take me away from a civil war, but she brought me to Kiev at the moment, which was only a couple of months after the Chernobyl disaster, which nearly had the whole of um, you know, Eastern Europe, all the way up to you know, Germany, etc., evacuated uh, potentially if it, the, the situation had escalated to even a far worse tragedy. So we were uh, that decision as a mother for her to make, taking from one danger zone to place me in another one where you know you could potentially be exposed to something else that's dangerous was must have been quite a difficult one and I reflect back on that and I think goodness what an exceptional woman and how, what strength she would, would have needed. Um, and then sort of subsequently I had this you know, magical upbringing. I was doted on by my grandmother, my great aunts, you know, I was a spoiled child who had the attention of so many elderly family members who wanted to compensate for obviously the absence of my parents and uh, with time I was reunited with my parents around the age of seven, eight when we reunited in the United Kingdom and we uh, moved to the United Kingdom to settle here. But it was almost a case of my parents sitting down with a map and thinking to themselves, where do we go? You know, where can we create a future? And I remember them, you know, the conversations many years down the line when I was an adult, my mum said I literally sat down with a map and I thought, you know, do we do the US? Do we go to the UK? Do we go to Switzerland? Where can we build a life in the future? And this is a side I think that people don't see when we discuss immigration or refugees or you know people from other cultures coming into nations, um, what journey they would have made and what difficult decisions they would have made to end up somewhere else. That often isn't really about choice, it's about survival and about the scope of being able to thrive and having a future and, um, and with such a hope that uh, they will be accepted by the nations that they're going into and win willing to contribute to the new cultures they, they then subsequently join in the new countries. So, that journey has really formed me um, and really, I think, determined the direction I was going to go in professionally in the work that I subsequently have gone on to do. Wow, just incredible, really. I, I, well, I commend you on your story. It's really, really incredible. You're so inspirational. And also, you know, it's always that, it's always that, uh, that gratefulness in, you know, look, despite all of this, how it turned out and how you use your past and your, your experiences to really push forward, break the glass ceiling for other human beings um, in similar situations, but also in other situations. You, know, you don't just stop with immigration, you go beyond way many other topics. So one thing that was really interesting for me when we talked, and I think it's really, it's a timely topic, politics right when we talked before this uh, before the recording now we talked about your experience in uk politics and well there was two things that really struck me one was that you you were in parliament when they decided not to vote to give children a free meal who cannot afford it in the uk how did that make you feel and how is that even possible, in your opinion, that we have politicians decide on who gets to eat and who doesn't in a developed country? Yes, I think this is very much a, a question of uh, sustainability and social justice. I think when we discuss that subject, we always think that it's somewhere else. We talk very uh, excessively about you know, the planet as a whole and needing to save it, and that, that poverty is somewhere else elsewhere in you know, developing nations or emerging economies, potentially. But actually, people forget uh, both politicians and even people in subsequently now the, the new um, uh, establishment that I belong to, which is chanting uh, climate justice and social justice, that, that poverty can exist on your very uh, doorstep and that those discrepancies in access to opportunities and access to resources exist even in the most wealthiest of countries where those injustices are happening. And yes, we are the United Kingdom. You know, we are you know, a very wealthy nation. And um, it really broke my heart and it really made me question uh, 
being part of the establishment in the past. Now I go into parliament and I work on my own terms, but it made me feel somewhat that it discounted all of the work that I had done for decades to show and, you know, and, and, and well, showcase the stories that exist out there, the facts that exist out there and how we need to transform society. Because when we immigrated uh, to the UK, uh, we had lost everything. So we potentially, we, we came from wealth, but we literally arrived here with a suitcase. So as a child, I experienced childhood hunger and childhood poverty here in the UK as much as I did so in, 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 the, in West Africa where it had escalated into a war. We experienced exactly the same conditions here in the UK that people wouldn't even believe where we didn't have enough food. Um, I recall my grandmother um, uh, when I was a child, when she subsequently joined us to live with us in the UK, she would actually go to the local markets and she, in, in the UK, in London, and she would pick up the fruit that would have fallen from the stalls um, that you know, the stall um, sellers wouldn't resell because they'd been crushed. And that would potentially be you know, our dinner that evening, you know, crushed apple pie or whatever, you know, some potatoes, etc. So that's how we started here in the UK with nothing. So I know what that feels like. So it really broke my heart, but that really comes down to the aspect that we have no diversity in our leadership. We have not enough women, so there's no gender diversity in parliament. There is no, um, you know, um, cultural diversity in, in parliament. So this is what happens when we have a lack of diversity and people coming from different classes, different genders, different cultures and different religions and different experiences. Only the collective element of people from different, um, you know, uh, different factions of society can come together to answer these questions because quite often the answers lie in the people who have experienced the pain in the first place. Those are the people who are most overlooked as to having the answers. We always, you know, refer to experts and, you know, uh, you know these leaders in, in, uh, in uh, and how we view things. But actually the, the true leaders and the, the true answers beyond the data lies with people who've experienced this live in their communities and where the pain is. And we need more of those people coming forward to run for office. So yes, it, it broke my heart. And um, especially that it was, um, um, you know, a political uh, party that is, uh, you know, uh, a Western one um, in a developed nation that would vote something like that down that now means there's going to be children going to bed hungry. Yeah, absolutely terrible. I, I was shocked when you told me because I do, I do know that in the UK, um, we do have a lot of problems and we have problems everywhere, right? Uh, also in Luxembourg, in Germany, France. But um, as I live mostly in the UK, what I noticed there as well, working with young girls, for example, a lot of, there's quite a big group of young girls um, who don't have, for example, sanitary pads when they have their periods. They don't, they cannot afford it. Uh, that's again the UK. Or children who don't have, well, no food during the winter, but also no heating. Mm -hmm. So um, a friend of mine, takes care of that as well as much as he can. And I think it's just crazy, you know, because um, how can a politician, and again, and then we move on, but how can a politician decide, again, who chooses between heating and eating kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. Why is that just not a normal thing for everyone to have under their basic human rights, as it should be, right? So um, another topic we talked about in politics again, because I think it's very relevant as well. And a girlfriend of mine, Gita, has experienced that firsthand as well. Uh, and you did too. Is that, how is it, what was your experience? I know, but I want you to tell our listeners. How was your experience in UK politics as a mother? So I was very successful in UK politics initially, um, and I was you know, considered a very desirable candidate at you know, certain given moments. I was voted by uh, you know, certain magazines and um, leading um, groups as uh, up and coming policymaker and up and coming politician of the year, etc. So I was 
you know, this, it was like a, a very uh, quick shooting, you know, rising star. Um, and uh, I, at that moment, thought perhaps there are certain elements that are going to uh, create barriers for me in running for office, for running for UK Parliament at that time, even though we're no longer going to be part of the European Union, but as someone on the UK Parliamentary Candidates List, you also had the opportunity to run for European Parliament. So I also took that opportunity to run as an MEP. Um, so it was sort of this wonderful uh, run that I had, and I thought potentially, you know, things like you know, my skin color or the fact that I'm from a biracial background, or sometimes people, you know, will place me, you know, biracial people are, you know, often refer to it as only black, etc. These things might get in the way of me um, running for office, but those things actually weren't the most difficult elements that I dealt with, even though. At, in certain instances, there might be some microaggressions on that, but that often was quite you know, subtle and I didn't experience too much of that in politics. But the thing that absolutely did annihilate me eventually in politics was that I paid the motherhood price, essentially. So they could accept many things about me being a woman, being someone who essentially wasn't born in this country, you know, um, being a, a black woman, a biracial woman, but the one thing that um, UK Parliament is very anti in specific parties, and I've seen this across all parties, so it's, it's not actually specific parties, I've seen this, you know, women experience this in the Conservative Party, in the Labour Party, who, you know, um, shout the loudest that they're pro, pro women and Lib Dems and even Green Party, who you would think should understand social justice and um, within that context, you know, gender equality, but even that is very male-led. Um, I actually found that um, many women experience this. So people will say, you know, women are not showing up for politics. They are. And what happens is they're leaving by the back door as soon as they have children. So it's, it becomes very uh, difficult to run when you have a young child, because when you are being selected for the respective constituencies that you're standing for, the questions that the constituents ask and also how head office deals with it is that, you know, do you have you know, young children and how are you going to manage your job? Whereas those same questions are not asked of our male candidates, because there's that presumption that there's a nanny or wife in the background who's going to take care of all of that. And so I found that my career literally disappeared overnight within the space of weeks of having my son. And I had, um, I had to have an emergency uh, cesarean section procedure, which meant that I was out for about two, three weeks. And by legal status, you, you, should, you shouldn't return to the office for six weeks by UK standards. Um, but I, I was in hospital and I wasn't able to attend the meeting two weeks after uh, you know, um, a major abdominal surgery and uh, that immediately um, caused an, an, an issue that I couldn't attend this meeting and I found myself in the firing line within the space of weeks and then I was re removed for multiple positions for that so I paid the motherhood price very significantly um, but the fascinating thing is when this happened and literally my career disappeared overnight things that I had worked for for a decade plus and it's a very difficult career to get into because it, it, you know you do it on top of your normal career because I had a job in investment banking and I ran for office separately because running for office doesn't pay you you have to have the assets and the sponsorship to run for office that's a side job um, so, so I had sacrificed so much over a decade to get there. I had overcome so many barriers as a woman, as a person of color, etc. And to to overcome all of these things, but yet be penalized, you know, so far down the line where you are, you know, that most desirable candidate who would be, you know, potentially a future cabinet leader, potentially future prime minister, um, was shocking. And I, I definitely paid the motherhood price. But at that given moment, I remember um, a couple of days after they visited my home to tell me that I, I was going to be removed from my positions. Um, and it's sad because the main position that I had that led to um, becoming an MP, the woman who had the position prior to me, she's an MP now, um, and the woman who uh, took my position replaced me also is an MP now, but both chose not to have children, which I understand is a choice, but that showcases the, the discrepancy in how they treat women. Um, and uh, so um, I remember a couple of days after that, I was, you know, with a newborn baby, just had sur surgery, my whole life disappeared overnight. And um, I just sat in the park and thought, you know, at that moment you can despair and uh, you can potentially, you know, hate motherhood or hate having a baby. And I remember looking at my child and I said to myself, I'm not going to allow the system breaking me or removing me in this way to allow, uh, to, to push me into a position where I, 
for some reason, I'm going to be angry at this child or angry at myself or angry at this given moment. So I, don't get me wrong, I was very angry, but I, I didn't want it to play out in, in me not liking then motherhood. So my biggest resistance was to say, well, this has happened. Now I have this beautiful child and I'm just going to take some time out and I'm going to enjoy motherhood. So that was my, my resistance to say, well, it, it is what it is, it happened. I'll, I'll come back from this. I'm not sure what I'm going to do yet, but you're not going to spoil this moment for me because I'm a mother and this child has just entered the world and I'm so excited by this and I'm going to enjoy this moment. Wow, what a story, but it's, it's really crazy because also, you know, for me, when I go to business meetings or like drinks in the evening, well, pre-corona right now no one goes for drinks anymore but uh, pre-corona right people would the first thing that people would ask me clients would be like oh who's watching the kids how are the kids you know what time do you need to be home for the kids and I just looked at the clients and I said firstly you know I, I, I see you want to try to kind of like put a like put some empathy in the conversation it's cute and so on I said but can we keep it professional um, mm -hmm. and my private life is none of your business you know, I am here, so I obviously took care of everything I needed to do, but it's, it's just, you know, men don't get asked that, and we have that all the time, and so I do understand, and that's just one example of many, you know, I have so many women, and I'm thinking about writing actually a book about that, like kind of like, a, you know, like tools of titans, but like the tools of motherhood, where you just share these stories, you know, where you have these stigmas of just being a woman in business. And uh, it's just, and some stories are really, yes, we laugh about it, but it's sad, you know, it's just crazy stuff happening. Like other women have some crazy stories, which I share with you offline. Um, as we're running out of time, but I have two questions. So one, where is Florence now? I know that you're working on a really incredible, incredible project with, um, with uh, the educational system. Can you briefly tell us a bit about that? And also briefly, maybe, what do you need? Uh, how can we help? Uh, I know that I will be probably be helping you, but the listener, how can, how can the listener help? And why does this project matter? Thank you so much. So yes, I, the recovery for me was to look at alternative routes as to how we can shape society, essentially, because I've realized being part of the establishment that the establishment does not work. And this is where I delved in the last uh, decade um, to transition into sustainability, social justice and climate justice work. And we do this work cross sector, um, touching on all industries, be it the finance industry, um, you know, the fashion industry, um, at all, and policy making, et cetera, as to how do we build new modeling to make our world more just and more safe. Um, but within this, I have delved into so many micro projects and I have recently joined the board of of the, um, the BBI 100 scheme, which is the Black um, Business Institute. And it was founded um, in the wake of the George Floyd um, US tragedy, where in the UK, we realized is that we haven't actually ever come together as a black community and as black uh, excellence influencers to try and contribute to how we can break the cycle of intergenerational poverty that exists in the black community for various reasons, um, which are you know, a little bit too, uh, too lengthy for us to delve into at this given moment. So this institute has been founded to amalgamate uh, black leaders in the UK, but equally um, intersectionally to bring people to the table like yourself and other wonderful individuals who are contributing from the corporate and private sector to from the public sector uh, from different cultures as to how do we uh, transform the community and uh, also um, deal with intergenerational poverty. So uh, we have, um, as our first initiative launched, the BBI 100, which will be taking an affirmative action route to place 100 children into the independent and leading school sector from um, the age of four uh, and to fund them through this education all the way up to the age of 18. And these 100 places are going to be matched by the schools and funded also by the school. So it will in fact be 200 children per September entering the leading independent schools. And we are currently um, supported by phenomenal and leading um, you know, 
private sector corporate groups such as H&M and Sky, etc. But, you know, this project needs to be even bigger than what we're envisaging because we need to, um, to create those leaders of tomorrow by putting them into these leading independent schools. But equally, we also need to have the money and, you know, VC, etc. to invest into black industry and black businesses, etc., to, to raise the community, give them access to opportunities. And it's often also not just about money. So yes, we are asset raising for these projects, but it's also about allocating time and access to information and opportunities, which is what people are lacking. That's the other half of the equation because people always think it's about money, but actually it's not just about money. So we are looking for people who are passionate about um, the future of children's education, not just for black children, but all marginalized communities. And how do you break, break the cycle of, of poverty that repeats itself generation after generation? And how can people have equal opportunity to rise um, and to, to achieve and to thrive, not just to survive? Um, so we're looking for people who would like to engage with that because this case study as to how we deal with um, black poverty, specifically in the black communities in the UK, can also be lifted as a case study for any community because you have other communities such as the Bangladesh and Pakistani communities etc who are suffering just the same in you know often in the European nations where they might uh, might uh, immigrate etc but then they find it very hard to to actually establish a um, uh, you know uh, a life that goes beyond survival and so I'm very excited to be part of this project because we are alive with 200 children in September entering the schools and the reason we have gone for leading schools and independent schools and taken an affirmative action route is because what we have seen in research is that um, in the UK 7% of children go to independent schools but this 7% goes on to dominate anything between 50 to 80 percent of all sectors at the top tier level, at board level, at you know, top leadership, CEO, um, CEO uh, level, etc. And, um, you know, uh, top tier leadership. So take the military, such as, you know, you, from your experience or, you know, um, the um, policymakers to uh, policymaking institutions, to the investment you know, finance institutions, to media, uh, you know, take the judiciary. The, this 7% are dominating every infrastructure to then take all of these positions. And what that means, sadly, is two things. One, it's a lack of opportunities for other people to enter these professions and to have a leading role in shaping our countries and our world. Um, but equally, what it means is that then uh, institutionally, there's a bias that will always exist and a blind spot in, in these institutions if they never have diversity. So we are, you know, it's like, you know, going around in circles because these people don't know how to change it because they've got that blind spot and there's no diversity to tell them otherwise. And then no one is entering you know, these professions. So you just keep on going around in circles as to this kind of misunderstanding and disconnect between society and leaders. Mm -hmm. So we are taking that affirmative action to place you know, future black leaders into the scheme um, by educating them as that 7% to then take leading posts in the future. So we're playing a very long-term game um, on, on, and a long-term vision on this. Um, and I know this scheme works because when we lost everything as a family, this particular scheme used to exist in the past. It wasn't privately funded. It was funded by the public um, sector at that time, by the government, uh, which used to pay for scholarship schemes for children who were talented to enter. And I was one of those. So I held a scholarship my whole life in the independent school. Um, and uh, that is what, um, you know, after we lost everything and arrived here and we were in poverty, allowed our family to rise again through having access to this education and then access to you know, top tier institutions to lead. And now I'm coming back and changing my communities so that, you know, I'm, a, I'm an example of, of this case study uh, that we are now going to be implementing with private funding. So we're looking for people to engage with us to support financially. Uh, this course, but equally we're also looking for people who are willing to give their time um, to also start to attacking that question of how do we deal with intergenerational repetition of poverty. And yes, we're dealing with a black community, but this applies to any marginalized community as a whole. Wow. Yeah, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to hear more of that and I will definitely also, under the video, put all of the information needed for people to uh, approach you and learn more about this initiative because I think it's really, really important. We are only as strong as the weakest link in our society. 
So it's important to lift everyone up at the same time. Um, so yes, beautiful. Thank you so much for your time. We have run out way of time, but I just loved everything you were saying. Uh, so very briefly, as we're going sadly into the second lockdown, do you have a quote or something, some, what, what inspires you, but very briefly, for mm -hmm. people to, to think about it or reflect on it or just enjoy it? I think we've realized at this given moment that we actually often have everything we need within ourselves and within our homes when we have been forced into this, you know, moment of just slowing down and being still. So that's been one uh, uh, wonderful element. But also as a sustainability advocate, I advocate every single day with such deep passion. And I believe it so deeply and you know, always worship it. But I, I adore nature and our world and our environment. You know, we're blessed for every blade of grass and every tree and, you know, and, and the fresh air, etc. And I know that there's people who are not privileged to have those um, uh, access sometimes to some of these resources. But equally, I also think that nature is very democratic and there is a way to find um, you know, nature and to engage with it. Um, so I think this is the moment where we start looking around and actually realizing that the thing that we need to love and respect the most is actually our nature and our environment around us because that is the thing that we've all been enjoying most because at best we're at home or you're able to go you know, for a walk somewhere. So I think uh, when you turn to nature, it has so many answers as to what we should be doing better <laughs> in our world. And that is my respite for everything and my inspiration for everything that I do. Beautiful. So thank you so much, Florence. Um, this was really fantastic. I learned so much and I'm so inspired and you know well we will be talking offline much much more anyways but people please do get in touch with Florence she's really incredible uh, and has so many other stories to say she was in ballet how she the, the obstacles there and how she overcame these and what they have invented there like just you are like a Pandora's box when you open dishes all of these amazing stories coming out of your past and literally how people have put stones and stones and stones and stones in front of you and you have just climbed these stones with such joy and elegance and resistance and resilience and just everything possible and you know it's just beautiful to see you where you are right now and um, you definitely have my support and I'm sure the people who are listening to this you have their support as well so looking forward to what comes out of this and uh, we speak very soon, Florence. Thank you for your time. Thank you.